Thank you. You may be seated. I certainly do hope that you are going to be able to come on this trip. Do you realize that I narrowly escaped with my life going to the Creation Museum this past week? Now, Daniel escaped from the lion's den, and Paul talks about how he was delivered from the mouth of the lion. But I was delivered from the mouth of the Tyrannosaurus Rex. And I have a picture to prove it, and pictures prove everything. There is a picture up there on that board at the front of me standing with my back to a Tyrannosaurus Rex, and his mouth is about to come down on my head. <laughs> so I encourage you, take a look at that. It's going to be a fantastic trip. We don't have enough yet for the bus. It's a commercial trailways bus, a very comfortable bus like you would take on a long trip. And uh, we need to have a minimum of 55 people who are signed up to be able to go. So if you have not yet signed up, please see me afterwards if you don't have the money to go. And that's the reason that it's holding you up from the trip. Please talk to me after the service. I think I'll be able to provide some funds for those who would like to go. As you know, this is one of my key issues because I believe that this is the reason that we have lost an entire generation of young people to the world. The doctrine of evolution, if it is true, makes it not necessary to have a God. If there is no God, there are no moral standards that are absolute. If we're only animals, we can live like animals. But there is incredible scientific evidence, not merely theological evidence, but scientific evidence. The creation is given as one of God's testimonies. There are three, and they're listed for us in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1, the light of creation, and we are to know it because it says the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. If you don't know what creation says, you will fall for the devil's lie that says the creation made itself. We can tell people all day long God made it, but they're being bombarded on every side from the time they're in elementary school all the way through college, if they go through college, and on into the world and all around them they see all kinds of PhDs claiming that science proves evolution. You need to learn a few very specific things so that you can counter that. You need to teach those things to your young people. If you don't, you will be held accountable. So I strongly encourage you to go to the Creation Museum. We are also this year emphasizing creation in our summer Bible school. Those of you who are not teaching, I encourage you to take a look at this little sheet that is stuck inside your bulletins this morning. It lists all the different DVDs that we're going to be covering as we go through those two weeks of summer Bible school in the adult class. You'll be able to pick up a few specific items which will enable you to answer the critics. Be ready always to give a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Not just tell people what the hope is. Yes, we believe in the hope. We believe there's a creator God. We believe that Jesus is the creator. We believe that he came to earth, died for our sins, was buried and rose again, and that he's coming again. Yes, but what's the reason that you believe that? Can you give a reason? When fables fall, unmasking the fables of evolution promoting truth, Darwin, deism, and the origin of species, myths and racism promoted by Darwin during, during and producing the culture shift, evolutionary fables and similarities, how observable homologies and homoplasies and living fossils speak of one creator, not one common ancestor, exposing the root of evolution. Few realize that the evolutionary thinking began with pagan philosophers thousands of years before Darwin, leaving your brains at the church door. You will really enjoy Jonathan Sarfati. Sarfati. He is a brilliant man. He can play up to a hundred chess games simultaneously while blindfolded and win. He has a brilliant mind. He is incredible at logic. And he's going to be talking about how to poke holes in the logic of the evolutionists. We encourage you to be here for that. That's on Wednesday. You should be here Wednesday evening for prayer meeting anyway. 
So that's the first one on Wednesday evening. And the second one will be Dinosaurs and Men, Five Clues to Dinosaur Origins, and uh, proofs that dinosaur and people lived together, and uh, proofs that dinosaurs did not evolve into birds. Thursday, fascinating one, human design, the making of a baby. The making of a baby. Irreducible complexity and fully integrated biological systems make evolution impossible. It's very tastefully presented. You don't have to worry about that. That's something you bring young people to. Creation evangelism in an Islam-aware world. What does creation have to do with the world that we live in, which is very much aware of what is going on with Islam? I'll let you read these yourself. Geology in the Great Flood, Geology by the Book, Astronomy Reveals Creation, Alternative Creation, Competitive Edge, Behemoths Buried Alive, Let the Rock Speak, Evolution versus Creation on a Level Playing Field. That's a really funny one. The High Tech Cell, Dr. Robert Carter, who presents that, has actually spoken here in person a couple of years ago. Uh, brilliant man. And then on Thursday, brand new, just out a couple of months, Evolution's Achilles Heel. That's 15 PhD scientists who in their own fields explain why the evolutionists who claim support from that field are wrong. It is an award-winning, fantastic film. That is Thursday, the first hour. And then the second, Evolution, the Root of the Problem. So uh, please take this, read it, show up as many times as you possibly can. I hope that you're able to come to all of those. And as Keith mentioned a moment ago, I was able to pick up a few, not as many as I would like, because of course there were 7,000 people there the, for the ribbon cutting ceremony. We were there for that uh, the first day and 8,000 people the second day. And we actually went a third day in the evening because we, there were so many people, we wanted to be able to see and read all of the signs. Incredible. Oh, folks, I hope I'll be able to show you some of those pictures when we get there, but there's some brochures on the Creation Museum itself. There's some brochures on the Ark encounter and all the things that are involved in the Ark. They have a petting zoo. We got to go pet all the little animals out there. I mean, they've got the animals that are in the Ark that move, that make noises. You can hardly tell they're not alive. They have done an incredible job of building these animals, including the dinosaur that you see my head almost getting bit off over there. But all the decks that are in the ark, and some of these out there. And then there's a picture of the ark and all the different things that are available uh, on the grounds. You will want to go. And if you don't have the money to go, talk to me after the service. If that's the only thing that's keeping you from going, we want, want you to go. We need you to go so that we can have a full busload. All right, enough of the advertisements for now, but that is very important. It's part of your spiritual growth. It is something that you need because you live in a world where it is essential for you to know and understand these truths. So please, sign up. The sheet is on the backboard in the hall near the prayer room. Take your Bibles, please, and turn back over to Exodus chapter 13. We just read that portion of Scripture dealing with the way of the wilderness. I hope you noticed it says that God led his people the way of the wilderness. They didn't just stumble into the way of the wilderness. God led his people through the wilderness. We're going to summarize what we've studied for the last four weeks in just a moment, and then we're going to learn why God led his people through the way of the wilderness, because that is foundational to the doctrine of sanctification which we have been studying. So over to Exodus chapter 13, quick review. Throughout the Old Testament, we saw that there's a striking emphasis on the firstborn. The firstborn is the beginning of the strength of a man's family. That's clearly seen in the prophetic words of Jacob on his deathbed and later in the specific laws related to the children born of more than one wife. The second thing we saw was that firstborn daughters also had certain privileges. For example, the first right of marriage. We saw that daughters are valuable as well as sons in the eyes of God, and that's far different from all the pagan nations of the world. We saw that the term firstborn is found exactly 100 times in the King James Bible, and only seven of those occurrences are found in the New Testament. Six of those refer to the Lord Jesus Christ, two referring to the physical firstborn son of Mary, four referring to his position in relationship to God the Father, and only one related to the actual firstborn slain or redeemed at the first Passover. We saw that Jesus is called the firstborn in the New Testament in contrast to the wicked firstborn sons in the Old Testament. They were all firstborn sons who forfeited their rights and inheritance. 
Jesus is the firstborn son who regained the rights of inheritance and passed them on to us, whom he calls his brethren. We learned one of the key lessons about how to lose the blessing of the firstborn when we looked at Esau. In Hebrews 12, verses 16 and 17, it says, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. And I emphasized, and I emphasize again, and you will hear me emphasize throughout my ministry, sexual immorality is given as an illustration of something you can do that can never be undone. It's an act that has permanent consequences no matter how badly you want to reverse it. In this case, it was true even with a slave. You lose something, you lose your blessings, you can never regain those specific blessings. Young people and older people, keep yourselves pure. Paul exhorted that to young Timothy, who is clearly a spiritual young man. And if Timothy needed that exhortation, you need it too, and so do I. Number seven, you cannot regain lost blessings. Reuben the firstborn illustrated this. Remember, sin has temporal consequences for the believer, even when we are forgiven. Number eight, there's a lesson to be learned in that. A very important lesson. I closed with this last time. The world, the flesh, and the devil often make their greatest attacks against the firstborn. Because the firstborn is the strength of the father and the responsibility of carrying on a godly heritage in the next generation. God also viewed Israel as his firstborn son, and that's why God killed the firstborn in Egypt. That explains why God commanded Israel to sanctify the firstborn before they could even begin the Passover. God had already sanctified, that is, he had set apart his firstborn son to die for our sins. And sanctifying the firstborn in Israel reminded Israel that failure to obey God always results, always results in death. That brought us to the doctrine of sanctification. It has some very intense doctrinal implications for us. Last week I gave you a quick summary of the three divisions of the doctrine of sanctification, which is illustrated by the sanctifying of the firstborn. The doctrine of sanctification, that is the setting apart of some person for a specific service to God, has three stages in the New Testament. We covered these very briefly last week. I'm just going to list them for you again before we get into the foundation for the way of the wilderness. Number one was positional sanctification. That's how God sees us in Christ. Number two was progressive and practical sanctification. That is how God is currently transforming our lives into the image of Christ every day. Number three was ultimate sanctification. That is the state of sinless perfection achieved only when we die and are present with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. Ultimate sanctification is when we are released from our old sin nature, which is always attached to our present body that is subject to death. You never get rid of the old sin nature. It can be overcome by the indwelling Holy Spirit who dwells in you and by the new nature that God gives to you at salvation, but you will have that old sin nature constantly warring inside you, as the Apostle Paul explains, even about himself until the day you die. The old sin nature is attached to this corruptible dying body. That's why a resurrection body is necessary. Ultimate sanctification. We will have no sin nature in our intermediate state before the resurrection and we'll have no sin nature in our resurrected body. Now, by way of introduction to the way of the wilderness, which we just read a moment ago, I want to develop the doctrine of sanctification so that you can see what happened when God tested his people. You say, well, what does that have to do with sanctification? Well, the people of God already had, just like you and I have, positional sanctification when God chose them and called them out of Egypt. They were his chosen people because of a promise to Abraham. 
Abraham was chosen before the foundation of the world, just like you and I were. He had a position that God had provided for him, not because of his works, but because of his faith. We see that both in the book of Romans and in the book of Galatians. Positional sanctification is portrayed for us with the children of Israel as they are about to leave Egypt. God shows them. He called them out of Egypt. But to obtain progressive, this is stage two, to obtain progressive sanctification or practical sanctification, as it's been called by some, they had to be tested in the wilderness. He wasn't just going to call them, plop them in the promised land, kill all their enemies without them having to do anything. They had to be tested. And so do you and I. You see, that's how God develops practical sanctification in your life. In other words, how God brings you and me to spiritual maturity. He's going to give you some tests in the wilderness. I don't know what comes to your mind when you think wilderness. I've been in the Sinai wilderness. I've been in the Negev in Israel, which is wilderness. I've been in the American West in some places which you think this couldn't possibly be on Earth. This has got to be Mars or somewhere else. I've had some wilderness experiences in going through life, things that tested me very sorely and very painfully. But God never left me. God led me through the wilderness. God never takes you to the wilderness unless he is going to lead you through the wilderness. Did you read the last few verses that we read this morning? Did you pay attention? It says, God gave them that pillar of cloud by day, that pillar of fire by night. And then it says, he took not away the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire. He led them the way of the wilderness and he never abandoned them in the wilderness. When things are getting tough, when things are getting unbearable, when you're facing death, perhaps, through some disease, when you're facing the loss of the one you love more than anyone in the world, and you know that happened to me, if God leads you to the wilderness, he will lead you through the wilderness. His presence will never leave you. But he leads you to the wilderness because he is going to lead you through the wilderness. That's what practical sanctification is all about. That's what your life as a believer is moving toward and you will have to go through it at some point because God's design for you is not merely positional sanctification it's progressive you're walking it's practical it's affecting how you live because he wants you and me to be witnesses not of ourselves he wants us to be witnesses for him. Practical sanctification. That's how God develops practical sanctification in our lives, how God brings us to spiritual maturity. He gives us tests in the wilderness. Now, I want us to look at the New Testament doctrinal statements concerning these three levels of sanctification 
because it will help us to understand what is happening to Israel in the Old Testament and not then put them in a box on the shelf and think, that's interesting, that's what God did back then, but to understand that that is what God is doing now in the lives of true believers. And it will help you to have courage when you face what you think is the impossible test. The barren wilderness where there seems to be no water. The barren wilderness where there seems to be no food. When you feel like you're starving and dying of thirst. When you simply think you can't go one step farther. Remember, that's how God tests you, tries you, matures you, and increases your faith. Because there are those who are walking behind you, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. And who knows what other friends or relatives or acquaintances are those who are watching you. How do you handle the wilderness? Let me just give you a quick statement of positional sanctification. It's found over in Ephesians chapter 1. We'll look also at a couple of verses out of Hebrews chapter 10. But Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 2. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That's positional. Look at the next verse. According as he hath chosen us in him. That's positional. When did that happen? Before the foundation of the world. We're going back to eternity past. Back in eternity past, God also chose a man by the name of Abraham. And through him, all the world was going to be blessed because through him would come the Messiah. But also through him would come Isaac and Jacob and the 12 tribes. And the 12 tribes would go down into Egypt. And they would multiply there. And God had made a promise to Abraham that he would bring them into that land which he had chosen and promised to them. And so they had a position, not because they were good in Egypt, not because they continued to worship and adore the one true living God in spite of persecutions. God had chosen them, and he had promised them, and he called them out, and he sent them into the wilderness. But their position was eternal past, before the foundation of the world, just like you and I, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Mm. He's moving toward the goal that he wants us to have, which is ultimately where we are in eternity, holy and without blame, in love having predestinated us, that in love is connected to the next phrase, not just holy and without blame before him in love, it's in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. We love him because he first loved us. You don't love God because you worked it up in yourself. It's a response to a, an eternal past choice that God made to love you. In love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. In case anybody wonders, it's God who does the choosing. Verse 6, here we have it again, our position. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in only one place, in the beloved, in him, in Christ, in the beloved. That's your position. That's positional sanctification. It leads to progressive sanctification, which is hinted at in that passage. It leads to, leads to ultimate sanctification, which is also stated in that passage. But you begin with your position. Sanctification is uniquely, all three stages, uniquely the work of the Spirit of God 
and it is tied permanently to salvation. It is uniquely the work of the Spirit of God. Each member of the Godhead has specific works that they do in relation to us who are the elect. It says so in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath, now here is your position being stated, and also your progress being stated and your ultimate goal, because God hath from the beginning, not he didn't think about this later on when things were rolling already, hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Now, I don't know how to cut that any other way. That's what the Bible says. We are accountable. We are responsible. God does hold us accountable for our choices and for our works. But the choice of salvation, God made that in eternity past. It says so. God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Now, how does he accomplish it? Do you have your Bibles open? I'm in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. I'll wait for a moment while you look at this verse. How do you know that I'm not making this up? You know, I stand up here and I say, and this is what it says in that verse, and everybody sits there with blazed eyes. I guess that's what it says. Check the preacher out. The Bereans check Paul out against the Scripture. You can check me out against the Scripture. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm reading out of verse 13. Look at the end of that verse. How does God do it? Through sanctification of the Spirit. Sanctification is uniquely the work of the Spirit of God and is tied permanently to salvation. Sanctification means to set apart. If you're set apart, the devil can't kill you until you get saved if you're one of God's elect. That's what it's saying here. The Holy Spirit sets you apart. Eternity past, God chose you from the beginning. The Holy Spirit sets you apart. That's the first stage of sanctification. There's going to come a day, in time present, when you trust Jesus Christ. There are no leaks between Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and Romans chapter 8, verse 30. You go all the way from God's eternal choices in, in the eternity past, all the way to glorification in eternity future in Romans chapter 8. And there are no leaks at any stage along the way. You've been set apart by the Spirit of God for uh, salvation. And he, what does he do? He causes you to believe the truth. It's the very last phrase of that verse. Okay, that's your position. Now I want to talk about what our text is going to be dealing with, which is progressive and practical sanctification. You're going to go through the wilderness. Do you know in the wilderness you're going to run into some enemies? We'll be talking about that later as the children of Israel are going through the wilderness. and Oh, they have Balaam trying to curse them. We get over the book of Numbers. Uh, they fight against Amalek in the wilderness. We find Moses praying for them and he's getting tired and Joshua and her have to hold up his arms you know, so that he can pray while the battle is going on. There are battles in the wilderness. There are times of deprivation in the wilderness. You're going to face it, people. You're going to face battle. Sanctification, progressive sanctification, is related to our spiritual warfare in the present time. Our current enemies are the world, the flesh, the devil, the demons. The world, the devil, and the demons are our external enemies. But the flesh is an internal enemy. And as we said it a moment ago, you can't get rid of it in this life. You know, one of the things that I've learned over many years of being a Christian is that every time I think I have a spiritual victory and I start to let my guard down, the devil knows and he attacks at that moment. The flesh knows and it opens the gate when all the guards have gone to sleep. Doesn't look like there's any enemy out there on the horizon. Some of you have read Macbeth 
And you know how the woods begin to move toward the castle because each enemy soldier has cut down a branch of a tree and is carrying it so they can't be seen. The enemy is always moving toward you and you have a quizzling. You have a betrayer in the midst. You open the door for the Nazis in Norway. An internal traitor. It's called your flesh. The outside enemies, as long as you've got the walls up, as long as you've got the gates barred, as long as you've got the, all of your soldiers in position, and they're empowered by the Spirit of God, and you've got the spiritual armor on, they can't get to you. And then you think you've won a victory. Oh, it feels so good. Have you ever been in a war where you won the victory? I said, praise God, I got through that. God, thank you for the victory. And you start to let your guard down. That's the moment the devil will attack. That's the moment the world will attack. That's the moment the demons will attack. That's the moment the flesh will open the door and let them in. The world, the devil, the demons, your external enemies, the flesh, your internal enemy that you can never get rid of in this life. That's what Paul describes in Galatians 5, verse 17. Look at the context. Starting in verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Paul understands the battle. You by yourself unaided are not able to win. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now, isn't that interesting? He's been talking about spiritual warfare. He's been talking about the flesh. He's been talking about all the things that come as a result of the flesh. And then he says, but you've led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. In other words, the law could never empower you to overcome the temptations which you face. All the law does is condemn you. All the law does is give you God's righteous standard. But it can never give you power to win. Oh, how many in the church think by putting themselves back under the law that they're being spiritual. And they go around, as I know some people in the OPC do, and they don't cook on Sunday because, after all, that would be lighting a fire on Sunday. Even if it only happens to be an electric stove, you know, and it's still sort of like lighting a fire. And so, you know, it said don't light a fire on the Sabbath day, and they call Sunday the Sabbath. And Sunday is never called the Sabbath, folks, and you are not under the law. It gives you God's standards. It doesn't mean that you can go out and do those things. What shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how that we shall, who are dead to sin, live any longer therein? It doesn't give you the right to sin. It gives you the power, the Holy Spirit, to overcome sin. Not being under the law is not your license to go out and live like a dog. Not being under the law means that being under grace, you're now motivated by love for Christ not by Mount Sinai. And love always goes farther than the law would ever attempt to go. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, and this is inside you folks. You may have never have expressed it verbally or in action. You might have expressed some of these through what you've looked at. But this is inside of you, it's inside of me too, because we're still in a body that's dying. And you don't get rid of the flesh. You don't get ultimate sanctification until you're in glory. This is always there, always ready to surface and show its ugly teeth. It's inside of you and me. Praise God, we have a regenerated spirit also, and we also have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. But we don't always take advantage of that. Listen, here's what's in you. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness. Those are sins of self-gratification. Lasciviousness, aselgia is the Greek word. It means 
doing things so shamelessly that you don't care that anybody else sees them and knows about them. Idolatry. That's in you, folks. Covetousness is idolatry. And the covetous man is an idolater. Colossians 3.5 and Ephesians 5.5. 5. If you've got covetousness, you are an idolater. Witchcraft. That's one of the works of the flesh. Did you know that in you, in your flesh, there is that kind of a drive? Hatred. Variance. Emulations. I'm going to give you an assignment. I'm not going to tell you what those two words mean. You've got to look them up. Do you know what variance means? Do you know what emulations are? I'm going to see if I can remember to do this next week. How many of you looked them up to see what those words mean? Look them up. Variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. This is inside you, folks. This is the flesh. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. In other words, this is not a complete list. We don't like to admit that stuff is in us. We try to stuff it. We try to gloss it over with the law and say, well, we've never done those things. That's what Paul describes as the flesh, the works of the flesh. That's where it pushes you. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past. Look at the last phrase. Paul is not just batting his gums together. He's not babbling in some kind of a mystical trance. Look at the last phrase of verse 21. That they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And you cannot overcome those things by trying to keep the law. You can only overcome those things by the grace and spirit of God. Working in your regenerated spirit because you've got a quizzling inside you still. It's called the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no... He hasn't lost his train of thought. Against such there is no law. Spirit versus flesh. Law versus grace. Praise God that he has given us grace in Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you and I would have absolutely no hope. By the way, just to remind you once again, I hope you learn this someday, the difference between long-suffering and patience. Some modern translations translate makrothumia as patience in this verse. It's long-suffering. The difference between long-suffering and patience Patience is dealing with difficult circumstances. Long-suffering is dealing with difficult people. Patience is, long, is, is di dealing with difficult circumstances. Long-suffering is dealing with difficult people. And they that are Christ's have... Now get this, what a fantastic picture, because it takes us back to the cross. They that are Christ's. Are you Christ's? Do you belong to Jesus? They that are Christ's, possessive, not plurals. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. But the flesh keeps wanting to get down off the cross. It's a long, painful death. There's screaming and agony and torment going on. Some people lasted for days on the cross. Jesus chose the moment of his death. It says, he gave up the ghost. But others would last for long periods of time, and that's why the Roman soldiers broke the legs of the two thieves. Because you see, what happens is you die by suffocation on a cross. The pain that you feel when you're letting down in your wrists, but it relieves the 
pain of the nails through your feet. And so you push up to get a breath because when you're hanging, you're having a hard time breathing. So you push up to take a breath. And then the pain again in the feet and you relax it again and you go down. And that could last for days with a strong man. But when they broke their legs, they could no longer lift themselves up and they're dying of suffocation. That's the picture he's giving you here of the flesh. It doesn't want to die. And it is very slow in dying. And it will scream and yell and do everything it can to get off the cross where you're crucifying it. They that are Christ. Are you Christ's? Do you belong to him? Have crucified the flesh. You nail it to the cross. With its affections and lusts. If we live in the spirit, there's your position. Positional sanctification. You live in the spirit. Now, progressive sanctification. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. That's how you live your daily life. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Practical sanctification. There is coming an end to the conflict because someday we will stand before Christ to receive our rewards for a race that is well run. Paul speaks of his race at its culmination. Second Timothy chapter 4. For I am now ready to be offered His life was going to be a sacrifice. The time of my departure is at hand. Oh, I pray that I can say this next verse at the end of my life. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Oh Lord, may I say it in truth. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. That's the terminal point of progressive sanctification. The terminal point of going through the battle. The terminal point of God leading you, though he never deserts you, leading you through the wilderness, developing in you the character of Christ teaching you to crucify the flesh with the affections and lusts. And for each of us, the terminal point will come someday. And we must ask ourselves the question, will we be able to say with Paul, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I ran the whole race. I didn't stop somewhere along the way. I have kept the faith, papistos, 
that body of truth once and for all delivered to the saints, then we'll know that henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. That the judge didn't overlook anything because he's a righteous judge, which the Lord, Jesus, the one who says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. But Paul wasn't the only one going to get it. He's looking down through the corridors of history and looking down to us and beyond us when he says, But unto all them also that love his appearing. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Purifieth himself, that's practical sanctification. That's living in the spirit and not in the flesh. That's walking not according to the law, but according to the love you have for Christ. Empowered not by that miserable stuff in our old sin nature, but empowered by the spirit of God. Are you doing it? God led Israel the way of the wilderness. He led them. He didn't say, try to find your own way, and they stumbled into the wilderness. God led them the way of the wilderness. And he does that with us, too, because he's going to conform us to the image of Christ. Our gracious Father, once again, we thank you for your word and for its power. You are our God, and you lead your dear children along. You never leave us nor forsake us. Jesus promised it. There are no leaks from the choice that you made in eternity past all the way to glorification. All the way from your predestinating purposes, all the way to our ultimate sanctification, there are no leaks. Father, we thank you for that because we could not keep ourselves. But the omnipotent, the almighty God, the God who made heaven and earth and all that in them is, is the God who holds us in the hollow of his hand, even in the wilderness. And for this we thank you, in Jesus' name, amen.